And so today I've got a two-part talk about really about some career tips from an employer's perspective. Um, there's some other esteemed employees in today, but uh, for me, as a small business, as a person who has hired international students, some tips that I've come across, and also talk about some of the visa changes. Now, I can't go through all of them because there's so many, and uh, I will highlight the major changes. Um, but hopefully today, you will A, get some tips of looking for a uh, job, and secondly, get an understanding of which way to look in terms of navigating this visa issue. Okay. But before I start my first part, I guess the first question I start is, who here is in a relationship? As anybody define it, you know, long term, short term, two days, five days, who would say they're in a relationship? With, you know, like a girl boy relationship, not like relationship with your Siri, your iPhone, or whatever, but who's in a relationship? Put your hand up. Fine. So probably about a quarter of you, the rest of you are too shy, and there's a girl looking at you and I say, put your hand up. Um, but you know, when we are looking at dating, you know, there's, there's, there's all these things to look at. There's some people here, um, you know that you have people in your class who are like, they ooh sex appeal. When they're looking for the opposite sex, everyone wants to go after them, everyone wants to meet them and know them. You know? And a lot of, many of us, the rest of us, you know, we have to work hard on the whole dating game. Um, you may not know much about me, but one thing you will know is, next slide, I'm married with two kids. So this is, um, my wife Joanne, my kids JP and Jasmine. And so if you know nothing else, you know that at least once in my life, I dated someone successfully. At least once, right? Otherwise, or maybe I could hire a, a date. But, you know, she is my wife, so I dated someone. And the reason I put this up is that dating is a skill, right? You have to learn the art of dating. Uh, I read earlier this year that you can actually go to dating classes. And this guy called Adam Lyons, anyone heard of him? He's apparently the number one pickup artist in the world. And he ran these classes, read this. The world's official number one pickup artist, Adam Lyons, is in Australia for the first time and is holding a three-day boot camp in Sydney tomorrow. For a cool $1,300 a head, 20 attendees will spend the weekend with Lyons and five trainers who will assess what each man is doing wrong with their search for love and guide them through practical pickup scenarios in the city's coffee shops and nightclubs. Okay. So you can learn how to date. And you're looking at me going, why is he telling me this? Have I got the wrong session? Is it upstairs? No. The reason I said this is as I examined this whole area of employer seeking, I found there's so much about looking for a job that is similar. That as we are looking for an employer, just like we're dating people, we're trying to find the right person, we have to develop skills, we have to develop the key skills to help us date an employer. Now, date in the sense of finding a job, not in the sense of, you know, I'm going out my, literally with my prospective employer. Um, that's not part of this talk. Um, so, you, as you're looking for a job, need to impress the employer, just like you impress them. You have to show them your skills. You have to show that you are someone worth employing. And so, the first part of my speech today is called The Art of Employer Dating. So, first we'll slide, 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 slide. The Art of Employer Dating. And before I start, I guess there's a few tips. First, the few things I want to say is this. As international students, Unfortunately, you are not going to be the Miranda Kerrs and Orlando Blooms of the employer dating world. Okay. You're not going to be the one who steps to the door and every employer is going to go, I want to hire you. you know. Not because you're not good people, not because you have good mark, you, you have good marks, but the fact is that as an international student, you have an inherent disadvantage compared to local students. Some of you may not have English as your first language and therefore communication stuff. Others of you just don't know enough employers in Melbourne to be able to network, and so you have a disadvantage. The second is this, that going to uni by itself will not guarantee you a job. Okay. It's not. Uni is important. Marks are important, but not everything. Okay. Marks are important, but not everything. Uh, and the classic example is once we uh, had a, a part-time student work for us who, he topped his year at Melbourne New York. He was a top student. Okay. He got the Supreme Court Prize. He worked with us as a student. But we didn't offer him a job, and no law firm did. Why? Because he was totally unteachable. He thought he knew everything. I mean, this is a law student. We try to give him work to do, and he tell us how to do it. You know, that's wrong. I want you to, I think this way, you know. He was just thinking he was too smart, he was unteachable and unhirable as a person. So while marks are good, they're not everything. And you think about this, you have to develop your profile to be able to go out there and find that job. And an underlying concept in all I talk about is called blue water marketing. Who's the concept? Who's a marketing student? One of you, three of you. Who, what's blue water marketing? Anyone heard that? No? Anyone heard that? Yes? Uh, <coughs> I think I did it. Marketing. 
uh, I'll compare it to my yeah? So basically, the, the concept is, if you're fishing at a pier where thousands of people are fishing, and there's five fish, what's your chance of catching the fish? Very low, right? But if you're in a boat and go in the sea to the blue water and look for fish that way, look for a market that way, you have a better chance. You following me? And as international students, you have to even more follow the concept of blue water marketing because you have to go to places where people aren't looking. The, the kings to me of blue water marketing is Apple. Okay. And you know, Steve Jobs, who unfortunately passed away recently, he was the visionary in terms of creating new markets. I mean, what's this? What am I doing? Zooming and pinching, right? Everyone done that before? iPhone, iPad? Yeah. Who knows, 10 years ago, no one did this. You know, I had a story that I went to a dinner party and these prep kids went to kid prep for the first time and they got a computer. And guess what they did on the monitor? They found a switch and spin around, right? And it wasn't working. For, for little kids, that's all they know. They are drilled in the Apple. And Steve Jobs and his company has developed products that no one thought we needed, right? When the iPad came up, everyone's going, including me, we don't need an iPad, what's the use of an iPad? I've got a laptop, blah, blah, blah. And then we're going to. Two days I bought one, all my friends have bought one, and now I never surf the web anywhere else than I've been. You know, he, he's created this thing. And so as I talk today, what I'm talking about is that you have, what I'm, the underlying premise is that you have to think about the blue water you're going to tap into. Because if all you do is go to seat.com, is go to the age web, website, and go to your careers department, and you know how many of your classmates going to do that? Everyone, right? then you are competing against everyone else in the whole marketplace, including the locals, including the people who have probably got better marks than you or better skills than you. But for Blue Water, you have to go out there and look for places that people aren't looking for. And that's what we're talking about today. So today I have four quick points about um, the art of employee dating before I get the biggest thing. So the first thing is this. Number one, if you want to increase your chance of dating, you need to meet more people, yeah? Meet more people. If you want to find the one that loves your life, the special one, whatever you want to call it, if you know one person in your whole life, what's the chance and that person is not suitable? Are you going to find the person? Clearly not. Right? In the same way, if you only know one possible employer, or if you only know a third of three possible employers, the chance of you getting a job are minimal. And this is where the concept of networking, networking comes in. Networking, networking, networking. If you want to secure your job, you have to broaden your network sphere. Because there's a principle here called the hidden job market. And the hidden job market basically says that between 60 and 70% of the jobs, they estimate, obviously it's hidden and it's secret, between 60% of jobs are never advertised. And you know about this, you know, you hear about people, how do you get your job? Oh, my friend told me about a vacancy at work, or well, who's working here? Who's, who's working at the moment? You know, some of you get your jobs because, you know, you heard of a friend working in a restaurant, right? Or someone's a vacancy or this thing happening. And so that's the hidden job market. They don't advertise, they're just jobs out there. And the thing about you guys is, because you come from a foreign country, you don't have established networks here. A lot of you back home, like who, who, who would, whose parents would know, like who's an accounting student? Like who, who, how many of you would, you know, you would know accountants back home? Yeah, yeah, a few of you, right? And so a lot of you would have parents who have contacts and stuff, but in Australia you don't. You don't, unless you have family, you don't have that network. And so it's so much more important that you go out there and network to find prospective employers. In my own firm, I hired three lawyers, and all three of them are former overseas students, and they all got their jobs through networks. They didn't, we didn't advertise the positions, we didn't have a post up on the AHC.com. They were friends, there were people who were leaders at OCF with me, there were people who worked part-time with me, there were people who got through the hidden job network. And the same way, you'll meet so many people, the recruiters here will tell you stories of a lot of the jobs out there you have to go and find and they're not readily available. And so you've got to go out there. And it's based, I guess, on the principle of the six degrees separation. Who's heard of the six degrees of separation? A few of you, what's the principle? Yep. So basically, everyone on this planet is connected to everyone else by six degrees. So you will know someone, know someone, know someone. And the classic example is Facebook. Imagine everyone, imagine everyone you knew was your Facebook friend. And you'd be lots of people. I know some of you have 2,000 friends already, but, um, you know, it would be a lot, and imagine if you went through your friends list, you could, the theory is you would find every single person on the planet eventually. And that's how networking works. You never know who you know, who you'll meet, who may be able to help you in a career development. You never know. It's not necessarily you'll meet an accountant one day to give you an accounting job. It could be, you know, you'll meet someone playing basketball whose dad's got a manufacturing company who needs a part-time accounts department. Or you will go to a function like this and meet someone who 
happens to work at RMIT, but that person's hairdresser has a company in electronics engineering that you may be interested in. You're following me? And so the networking principle is based on friends, friends list, extended friends list, and being able to tap into that. And so the same way, the more people you meet the network with, the better chance you have of finding a job. And how do you network? Well, obviously there's functions, professional functions. There's accounting functions, there's law functions, there's marketing functions, all sorts of things. There are professional things you can go to that will specifically tailor for industry. And so how do you find that? Well, I can't tell you that. You need to go out there and find that. Like, what are you studying here? Computer science, you know. There'll be computer science development functions, there'll be ACS functions, there's all sorts of things. There'll be things in the suburbs, there'll be things in the country, there's things that you can tap into. I mean, there are lots of things that you can see. And so the first point is meet more people. The second point is this, have an interesting life. Have an interesting life. The first question I ask people usually when I meet them is not what you do for a living, where you study, what do you do for fun? What's your hobby? And surprising that a lot of my friends who've got kids have no fun as in hobbies anymore. We're just too busy raising kids. But, you know, people want to know that you're interesting. If you're dating someone, people like to know that you like rock climbing or you like, I don't know, interpretive dance or whatever you like to do, right? I, I remember when I was working in Taiwan, there was a lawyer who became a partner at the time. And he was famous because at his interview, they asked him, what do you do for fun? And he said, I like reading law textbooks. That was his hobby. Now, I can guarantee you, if you said that here, you would not get many jobs here. In Australia, it's not looked upon, yeah, it's not looked upon very, in, maybe in Taiwan at the time, people thought that was hard working and it's kind of psycho back there, but in Australia, they'll think you're weird. If you went on a date and someone told you, I like reading accounting textbooks, people think you're weird, right? In the same way, you know, you have to have an interesting life. People are not just interested in what you've studied, they're interested in who you are, and the recruiters will tell you this. They're looking for your, your hobbies, what you've done, you know, have you gone and to volunteer, have you done things interesting? Do you, have, do you do sports? Do you, you know, do paralegal work? Do you do volunteer work? You know, it's all part of your profile. When I interview people, yes, I look at their marks, but to me, as long as they're not failing, as long as they've got solid marks, that's okay for me. It's more about who they are. Will they fit the culture of my firm? There's a saying that goes, employers hire for a career, not position. And what that means is, is that they're not just hiring you to be a computer programmer. So if you, you can program faster than Bill Gates, that's great. But they're not looking just who can program. Because there are thousands of people who can program. They're looking for a programmer who can become a manager, who can become a team leader, who can see clients. And they're the valuable skills. And so your communication skills, your, your personal skills, your hobbies, your ability to connect with your people is important. So you have to have an interesting life. And so you, you've got to get experience. I mean, I know it's hard to get jobs out there, but you need to show that you've got the capability to do things. And to me, office experience is always so important. Office experience. Because when I hire someone as a professional who's worked in office, they've learned certain things. We've had people come to us who can't post letters. And you may think that's silly, but they're not used to the yellow box and the red box. You know the yellow box and the red box? Maybe not, maybe you have. But there's a yellow box for express box, right? Now you put a red, you put a normal envelope in the Red box. No, if you put an express post in the red box, it won't be express. And as lawyers and as professionals, sometimes you have deadlines, right? We had a student worker put it in the red box and we couldn't track it, all sorts of things went wrong. But things like that are important. So even if you're volunteering, even if you, like if you're an accountant, even if you're in an accounts class, even if you're doing bookkeeping, even if you're doing data entry, if you've worked in an office, you've learned about PABXs, tax machines and stuff, it helps you. So I implore you, if you can, get some sort of office experience in your resume. It just, it just gives the employer a pressure you understand. Australian workplace culture. Is it hard to find these places? Of course, but again, through your networks, through the people you meet, you may be able to find someone who can get you the job. So volunteer if you have to, is my last one. Okay, so what's my first point? Do you remember? Meet more people, good. Secondly, have an interesting life. And thirdly, live Australian culture. Live Australian culture. You know, mixed marriages can be fraught with danger. You know the movie, Big, My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Some, yeah. You know, you have the, the Greek woman and the, the American guy and the problems they have about cultural. And the same thing with, you know, uh, Australians and different cultures, right? And the same way you have come from a different culture, not a wrong culture, it's different. And for you, you may have to learn about Australian workplace culture. Because Australian culture is different. It's different. Um, there's a few points up there, but, you know, is this, people say that uh, it is more egalitarian. And what that means is that in Australia, you will interact with and mix with your managers and employees and your bosses. 
my friends who work in London, they, um, they, as lawyers, they would never ever speak to their, their, their law partners. The partners are the ones who used to, they were lawyers, they hunted foxes on weekends, they had big mahogany rooms, and he said he never spoke to his partners. And in Asia, it's very similar. Some of you, if you work as a professional, as you start off, you'll be at the desk and you'll never speak to your direct employers. Well, in Australia, it's different. You know, you will have Friday drinks. Who's experienced Friday drinks before? Who's works here? You know, Friday drinks is great. You know, there's this thing where suddenly about 4.30, everyone disappears. And uh, they will go for drinks. You know, you'll have drinks with your boss. You'll go to functions with your boss. And so you have to learn the fact that it's a different culture here. Um, it is generally for formal. It is not overly formal. Um, I remember <coughs> I uh, had this Wall Street work for us part time. She was from China. And on his third day, I said to him, Let's go for coffee. Okay. And he said, Well, I don't think I'll. I said, no, Let's go for coffee. He goes, Now, what was, I, what, was I, what was I asking him? Was I asking him, Do you like this beverage of choice? If not, don't worry about it. Was I asking him that? No, right. I was asking what? What am I asking you? Let's get to know each other. I want to find out about you. I don't know you very much. But he was saying, oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> And guess what? Did I hire him? No. And did anyone hire him? No. Because he had no concept of Australian culture. Not right or wrong, just different. Right? And so you have to understand that it's a different workplace culture here. Um, we are, it's generally not overly formal, but that doesn't mean it's not professional. Some people think that we're casual Fridays, we can be unprofessional. No, Australian workplaces, KPMG, all these people are still very professional. But we just sometimes are more casual than what we do. But we have to know about Australian culture and understand the facets of it. You know, I, who knows, who, who remembers or knows what happened earlier this, earlier this month in October? What happened in the last, the first Saturday of October? Grand final. Who knew there was a grand final one? Okay, about a quarter of you. I guarantee you, I wouldn't hire you if you came to me. You didn't know the grand final one. Because Collingwood was in the grand final, and unfortunately, the wrong, the wrong team lost. But, um, you know, <laughs> we, it, I know people who've gotten jobs because they're interview, they talk about footy. And you'll hear stories about that. In winter, all Aussie male, a lot of women talk about is footy. Footy tipping is going to be on the weekend, how much we pay Collingwood, blah, 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 whatever it is. Um, footy. And, and that's part of our culture. And so, one tip I have for you is barrack for footy team, barrack for Collingwood, you'll get you lots of friends. <laughs> <laughs> but learn about Australian stuff at footy. Cricket's a bit harder, you know, this 5 day thing we get a ball. I mean, if you're from a cricket culture, it's a bit hard to follow. But, you know, you have to learn about Australian culture and where it is. Because one of the biggest issues facing international students, often in the task force reviews, is about social isolation. Students who come to Australia, they live with five other Hong Kong people, they work in a Hong Kong restaurant, um, they study with honkies, and basically they speak Canto the whole time. And there are studies done that some people come to Australia and their alt score goes down, honestly, because they don't mix and they don't integrate their culture. And so if you want to improve your chances of dating that employee, you have to learn Australian culture and immerse yourself in it. How do you do that? Well, again, there are, this is where your hobbies come in. I mean, oh, uh, what are you, your name, what's, your, what's your name here? What's your hobby? Anything? Reading books? Okay. Uh, what's your name? What's your name? April likes reading books. Okay. Now, who knows? There are book reading clubs, there are you know, book forums, there are things you can meet. Yeah, there, there are things that people read books together. And so, what's your name? Huh? Alex. Alex, what do you like to do, Alex? What's your hobby? Long distance running, okay, great. You know, I joined a running club at my, my um, gym. I trained for a marathon last year. I got to know these people, you know. You can join running clubs in gyms, universities, and what sort of thing. And you'll meet locals and you club. You get what I'm saying? There are things you can do to learn about Australian culture. It doesn't mean you, you don't have to go to a semester of Australian culture 101, you know, where you learn about Barbies and I don't know, I don't know where you learn and, and Coconut Dundee. I don't know what you do in Australian culture. But, you know, you just learn through experience. And so, leave the Australian culture.